Side 2 Chapter 6 A Woman First of all, said Poirot, I should like a word or two with young Monsieur McQueen. He may be able to give us valuable information. Oh, certainly, said Monsieur Bouc. He turned to the chef de train. Get Monsieur McQueen to come here. The chef de train left the carriage. The conductor returned with a bundle of passports and tickets. Monsieur Bouc took them from him. Oh, thank you, Michel. It would be best now, I think, if you were to go back to your post. We will take your evidence formally later. Very good, monsieur. Michel, in his turn, left the carriage. After we have seen young McQueen, said Poirot, perhaps monsieur le docteur will come with me to the dead man's carriage? Certainly. And after we have finished there? But at this moment the chef de train returned with Hector McQueen. Monsieur Bouc rose. Oh, we are a little cramped here, he said pleasantly. Take my seat, Monsieur McQueen. Monsieur Poirot will sit opposite you, so. He turned to the chef de train. Clear all the people out of the restaurant car, he said, and let it be left free for Monsieur Poirot. You will conduct your interviews there, mon cher? Uh, it would be the most convenient, yes, agreed Poirot. McQueen had stood looking from one to the other, not quite following the rapid flow of French. Ah, uh, qu'est-ce qu'il y a? He began laboriously. Ah, uh, pourquoi? With a vigorous gesture, Poirot motioned him to the seat in the corner. He took it and began once more. Ah, uh, pourquoi? Then, checking himself and relapsing into his own tongue, Hey, what's up on the train? Has anything happened? He looked from one man to another. Poirot nodded. Exactly. Something has happened. Prepare yourself for a shock. Your employer, Monsieur Ratchet, is dead. McQueen's mouth pursed itself in a whistle. Except that his eyes grew a shade brighter, he showed no signs of shock or distress. So they got him after all, huh? he said. Well, what exactly do you mean by that phrase, Monsieur McQueen? McQueen hesitated. Uh, you are assuming, said Poirot, that Monsieur Marchette was murdered? Well, wasn't he? This time McQueen did show surprise. Why, yes, he said slowly. That's just what I did think. Do you mean he just died in his sleep? Why, the old man was as tough as, uh, as tough... Well, he stopped, at a loss for a simile. Oh, no, 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 said Poirot. Your assumption was quite right. Monsieur Ratchet was murdered, stabbed. But I should like to know why you were so sure it was murder, and not just death. McQueen hesitated. Oh, I must get this clear, he said. Who exactly are you, and where do you come in? I represent the Compagnie Internationale de Wigonli. He paused, then added, I am a detective. My name is Hercule Poirot. If he expected an effect, he did not get one. McQueen said merely, Oh, yeah? And waited for him to go on. You know the name, perhaps? Why, well, it does seem kind of familiar, only I always thought it was a woman's dressmaker. Hercule Poirot looked at him with distaste. It is incredible, he said. Well, what's incredible? Nothing. Let us advance with the matter in hand. I want you to tell me, Monsieur McQueen, all you know about the dead man. You were not related to him? Uh, no. I am, uh, was, his secretary. Uh, for how long have you held that post? Uh, just over a year. Please give me all the information you can. Well, I met Mr. Ratchet just over a year ago when I was in Persia. Poirot interrupted. Oh, what were you doing there? Well, I had come over from New York to look into an oil concession. I, I don't suppose you want to hear all about that. My friends and I had been let in rather badly over it. Mr. Ratchet was in the same hotel. He had just had a row with his secretary. He offered me the job, and I took it. I was at a loose end and glad to find a well-paid job ready-made, as it were. And since then? 
Well, we have travelled about. Mr. Ratchet wanted to see the world. He was hampered by knowing no languages. I acted more as a courier than as a secretary. It was a pleasant life.、Hmm. Now,、uh, tell me as much as you can about your employer. The young man shrugged his shoulders. A perplexed expression passed over his face. Well, that's not too easy. Well, what was his full name? Samuel Edward Ratchet, and he was an American citizen. Yeah. Well, what part of America did he come from? I don't know. Well, tell me what you do know. Well, the actual truth is, Mr. Poirot, <laughs> that I know nothing at all. Mr. Ratchet never spoke of himself or of his life in America. Well, why do you think that was? I don't know. I imagine that he might have been ashamed of his beginnings. Well, some men are.、Uh, does that strike you as a satisfactory solution? Well, frankly, it doesn't. Has he any relations? I never mentioned any. Poirot pressed the point. You must have formed some theory, Monsieur McQueen. Well, yes, I did. For one thing, I, I don't believe Ratchet was his real name. I think he left America definitely in order to escape someone or something. I think he was successful until a few weeks ago. Oh, and then? Why、well, he began to get letters, threatening letters. Did you see them? Why, yes. It was my business to attend to his correspondence. The first letter came a fortnight ago. And were those letters destroyed? No, I think I've got a couple still in my files. One I know Ratchet tore up in a rage. Shall I get them for you? Well, if you would be so good. McQueen left the compartment. He returned a few minutes later and laid down two sheets of rather dirty notepaper before Poirot. The first letter ran as follows: "Thought you'd double cross us and get away with it, did you? Not on your life. We're out to get you, Ratchet, and we will get you." There was no signature. With no comment beyond raised eyebrows, Poirot picked up the second letter. We are going to take you for a ride, Ratchet, sometime soon. We are going to get you. See. Poirot laid the letter down.、Hmm, the style is monotonous, he said, more so than the handwriting. McQueen stared at him. You would not observe, said Poirot pleasantly. It requires the eye of one used to such things. This letter was not written by one person, Monsieur McQueen. Two or more persons wrote it, each writing a letter of a word at a time. Also, the letters are printed, and that makes the task of identifying the handwriting much more difficult. He paused, and then said, "Did you know that Monsieur Ratchet had applied for help to me? To you?" McQueen's astonished tone told Poirot quite certainly that the young man had not known of it. He nodded. "Oh yes, he was alarmed." Tell me, how did he act when he received the first letter? McQueen hesitated. Why,、well, it's difficult to say. He,、uh, well, he passed it off with a laugh in that quiet way of his, but somehow he gave a slight shiver. I felt that there was a good deal going on underneath the quietness. Poirot nodded. Then he asked an unexpected question. Mr. McQueen, will you tell me quite honestly exactly how you regarded your employer? Did you like him? Hector McQueen took a moment or two before replying. No, he said at last. I did not. Why? I can't exactly say. He was always quite pleasant in his manner. He paused, then said, "I'll tell you the truth, Mr. Poirot. I disliked him and distrusted him." He was, I am sure, a cruel and a dangerous man. I must admit, though, that I have no reasons to advance for my opinion. Thank you, Monsieur McQueen. Oh, one further question: When did you last see Monsieur Ratchet alive? Ah,、uh, last evening, about.、Um, he thought for a minute. Ten o'clock, I should say. I went into his compartment to take down some memoranda from him. Oh, on what subject? Some tiles and antique pottery that he bought in Persia. What was delivered was not what he had purchased. There has been a long, vexatious correspondence on the subject, and that was the last time Monsieur Ratchet was seen alive. Why, yes, I suppose so. 
Do you know when Monsieur Wretched received the last threatening letter? On the morning of the day we left Constantinople. Ah, now there is one more question I must ask you, Mr. McQueen. Were you on good terms with your employer? The young man's eyes twinkled suddenly. Huh, this is where I'm supposed to go all goose fleshy down the back, huh? <laughs> In the words of a bestseller, you've nothing on me. <laughs> well, Ratchet and I were on perfectly good terms. Perhaps, Monsieur McQueen, you will give me your full name and your full address in America. McQueen gave his name, Hector Willard McQueen, and an address in New York. Poirot leaned back against the cushions. Well, that is all for the present, Monsieur McQueen, he said. I should be obliged if you would keep the matter of Monsieur Wretched's death to yourself for a little time. Well, his valet masterman will have to know. Oh, well, he probably knows already, hmm? said Poirot dryly. If so, try to get him to hold his tongue. Well, that oughtn't to be difficult. He's a Britisher and does what he calls keeps himself to himself. Hmm? He has a low opinion of Americans and no opinion at all of any other nationality. Thank you, Monsieur McQueen. The American left the carriage. Well, demanded Monsieur Bouc, you believe what he says, this young man? He seems honest and straightforward. He did not pretend to any affection for his employer, as he probably would have done had he been involved in any way. It is true, Monsieur Rachet did not tell him that he had tried to enlist my services and failed, but I do not think that is really a suspicious circumstance. I fancy Monsieur Ratchet was a gentleman who kept his own counsel on every possible occasion. So you pronounce one person at least innocent of the crime, <laughs> said Monsieur Bouc jovially. Poirot cast on him a look of reproach. Me? I suspect everybody to the last minute, he said. All the same... I must admit that I cannot see this sober, long-headed McQueen losing his head and stabbing his victim twelve or fourteen times. It is not in accord with his psychology? No, not at all. No, said Monsieur Bouc, thoughtfully. That is the act of a man driven almost crazy with a frenzied head. It suggests more the Latin temperament, or else it suggests, as our friend the chef de train insisted, a woman... Chapter 7 The Body Followed by Dr. Constantine, Poirot made his way to the next coach and the compartment occupied by the murdered man. The conductor came and unlocked the door for them with his key. The two men passed inside. Poirot turned inquiringly to his companion. How much has been disarranged in this compartment? Nothing has been touched. I was careful not to move the body in making my examination. Poirot nodded. He looked round him. The first thing that struck the senses was the intense cold. The window was pushed down as far as it would go, and the blind was drawn up. <sighs> observed Poirot. The other smiled appreciatively. I did not like to close it, he said. Poirot examined the window carefully. Mm, you are right, he announced. Nobody left the carriage this way. Possibly the open window was intended to suggest the fact, but if so, the snow has defeated the murderer's object. He examined the frame of the window carefully. Taking a small case from his pocket, he blew a little powder over it. No, no fingerprints, I told, he said. That means it has been wiped. Well, if there had been fingerprints, it would have told us very little. They would have been those of Monsieur Ratchet or his valet or the conductor. Criminals do not make mistakes of that kind nowadays. And that being so, he added cheerfully, we might as well shut the window. Positively, it is the cold storage in here. He suited the action to the word, and then turned his attention for the first time to the motionless figure lying in the bunk. Ratchet lay on his back. His pyjama jacket, stained with rusty patches, had been unbuttoned and thrown back. I had to see the nature of the wounds, you see, explained the doctor. Poirot nodded. He bent over the body. Finally, he straightened himself with a slight grimace. <sighs> it is not pretty, he said. Someone must have stood there and stabbed him again and again. <gasps> How many wounds are there exactly? I make it twelve. One or two are so slight as to be practically scratches. On the other hand, at least three. 
would be capable of causing death. Something in the doctor's tone caught Poirot's attention. He looked at him sharply. The little Greek was standing, staring down at the body with a puzzled frown. Something strikes you as odd, does it not? He asked gently. Speak, my friend. There is something here that puzzles you, huh? You are right, acknowledged the other. Well, what is it? You see these two wounds here and here, he pointed. They are deep. Each cut must have severed blood vessels, and yet the edges do not gape. They have not bled, as one would have expected. Ah, which suggests that the man was already dead. Some little time dead. When they were delivered? <laughs> but that is surely absurd. Ah, it was seem so, said Poirot thoughtfully, unless a murderer figured to himself that he had not accomplished his job properly and came back to make quite sure. But that is manifestly absurd. Anything else? Well, just one thing. Ah, uh, and that? You see this wound here, under the right arm, near the right shoulder. Take this pencil of mine. Could you deliver such a blow? Poirot raised his hand. Ah, precisimo, he said. I see. With the right hand, it is exceedingly difficult, almost impossible. One would have to strike backhanded, as it were. But if the blow were struck with the left hand... Hmm. Exactly, Monsieur Poirot. That blow was almost certainly struck with the left hand. Ah, so that our murderer is left-handed? No, it is more difficult than that, is it not? As you say, Monsieur Poirot, some of these other blows are just as obviously right-handed. So, two people? We are back at two people again, murmured the detective. He asked abruptly, Was the electric light on? Well, it is difficult to say. You see, it is turned off by the conductor every morning about ten o'clock. Ah, the switches will tell us, said Poirot. He examined the switch of the top light and also the roll-back bed headlight. The former was turned off. The latter was closed. Eh bien, he said thoughtfully, we have here a hypothesis of the first and second murderer, as the great Shakespeare would put it. The first murderer stabbed his victim and left the compartment, turning off the light. The second murderer came in, in the dark, did not see that his or her work had been done, and stabbed at least twice at a dead body. Que pensez-vous de ça? Oh, magnificent, said the little doctor with enthusiasm. The other's eyes twinkled. You think so? <laughs> I am glad. It sounded to me a little like the nonsense. Well, what other explanation can there be? Well, that is just what I am asking myself. Have we here a coincidence or what? Are there any other inconsistencies such as would point to two people being concerned? Well, I, I think I can say yes. Some of these blows, as I have already said, point to a weakness, a lack of strength, or a lack of determination. They are feeble, glancing blows. But this one here, and this one, again he pointed, great strength was needed for those blows. They have penetrated the muscle. Ah, so they were, in your opinion, delivered by a man? Most certainly. Hmm. They could not have been delivered by a woman? Well, a young, vigorous, athletic woman might have struck them, especially if she were in the grip of a strong emotion, but it is, in my opinion, highly unlikely. Poirot was silent a moment or two. The other said anxiously, You understand my point? Oh, perfectly, said Poirot. The matter begins to clear itself up wonderfully. <laughs> the murderer was a man of great strength. He was feeble. It was a woman. It was a right-handed person. It was a left-handed person. Ah, c'est rigolo tout ça. He spoke with sudden anger. And the victim? What does he do in all this? Does he cry out? Does he struggle? Does he defend himself? He slipped his hand under the pillow and drew out the automatic pistol which Ratchet had shown him the day before. Fully loaded, you see, he said. They looked around them. 
Ratchet's day clothing was hanging from the hooks on the wall. On the small table formed by the lid of the washing basin were various objects: false teeth in a glass of water, another glass empty, a bottle of mineral water, a large flask, and an ash tray containing the butt of a cigar and some charred fragments of paper. Also, two burnt matches. The doctor picked up the empty glass and sniffed it. Here is the explanation of the victim's inertia," he said quietly. "Oh, drugged? Yes." Poirot nodded. He picked up the two matches and scrutinized them carefully. "You have a clue, then?" demanded the little doctor eagerly. "Well, those two matches are of a different shape," said Poirot. "One is flatter than the other. You see." "Ah, it is the kind you get on the train," said the doctor. "In paper covers." Poirot was feeling in the pockets of Ratchet's clothing. Presently, he pulled out a box of matches. He compared them carefully. Ah, the round one is a match struck by Mister Ratchet," he said. "Let us see if he had also the flatter kind." But a further search showed no other matches. Poirot's eyes were darting about the compartment. They were bright and sharp, like a bird's. One felt that nothing could escape their scrutiny. With a little exclamation, he bent and picked up something from the floor. It was a small square of cambric, very dainty. In the corner was an embroidered initial, H. Ah, a woman's handkerchief," said the doctor. "Our friend, the chef de train, was right. There is a woman concerned in this. Ah, and most conveniently, she leaves her handkerchief behind," said Poirot. Exactly as it happens in the books and on the films,、huh? and to make things even easier for us, it is marked with an initial.、Oh, what a stroke of luck for us! Exclaimed the doctor. Is it not? <laughs> said Poirot. Something in his tone surprised the doctor, but before he could ask for elucidation, Poirot had made another dive onto the floor. This time he held out on the palm of his hand a pipe cleaner. It is perhaps the property of Monsieur Ratchet," suggested the doctor. "Well, there was no pipe in any of his pockets, and no tobacco or tobacco pouch. Then it is a clue." "Oh, decidedly," and again dropped most conveniently. "A masculine clue this time, you note.、Hmm. One cannot complain of having no clues in this case. There are clues here in abundance. Oh, by the way, what have you done with the weapon?" There was no sign of any weapon. The murderer must have taken it away with him. I wonder why," mused Poirot. Ah, the doctor had been delicately exploring the pajama pockets of the dead man. I overlooked this," he said. "I unbuttoned the jacket and threw it straight back." From the breast pocket, he brought out a gold watch. The case was dented savagely, and the hands pointed to a quarter past one. You see," cried Constantine eagerly. "This gives us the hour of the crime. It agrees with my calculations. Between midnight and two in the morning is what I said, and probably about one o'clock, though it is difficult to be exact in these matters. Eh bien, here is the confirmation: a quarter past one. That was the hour of the crime. Ah, it is possible. Yes, it is certainly possible. The doctor looked at him curiously. You will pardon me, Monsieur Poirot, but I do not quite understand you. I do not understand myself," said Poirot. "I understand nothing at all, and as you perceive it, it worries me." He sighed and bent over the little table, examining the charred fragment of paper. He murmured to himself, "What I need at this moment is an old-fashioned woman's hat box." Doctor Constantine was at a loss to know what to make of this singular remark. In any case, Poirot gave him no time for questions. Opening the door into the corridor, he called for the conductor. The man arrived at a run. How many women are in this coach? The conductor counted on his fingers. One, two, three, six, Monsieur. The old American lady, a Swedish lady, the young English lady, the Countess Andrani, and Madame la Princesse Dragimirov, and her maid. Poirot considered. They all have hat boxes, yes, yes, Monsieur. 
Then bring me, let me see,、uh, yes, the Swedish ladies and that of the lady's maid. Those two are the only hope. <laughs> you will tell them it is a customs regulation, something, well, anything that occurs to you. Oh, that will be all right, monsieur. Neither lady is in her compartment at the moment. Oh, then be quick. The conductor departed. He returned with two hat boxes. Poirot opened that of the lady's maid and tossed it aside. Then he opened the Swedish ladies and uttered an exclamation of satisfaction. Removing the hats carefully, he disclosed round humps of wire netting. Ah, here is what we need. Ah, about fifteen years ago, hat boxes were made like this.、Mm-hmm. You skewered through the hat with a hat pin onto this hump of wire netting. As he spoke, he was skillfully removing two of the attachments. Then he repacked the hat box and told the conductor to return them both where they belonged. When the door was shut once more, he turned to his companion. See you, my dear doctor. Me, I am not one to rely upon the expert procedure. It is the psychology I seek, not the fingerprint or the cigarette ash. But in this case, I would welcome a little scientific assistance. This compartment is full of clues, but can I be sure that those clues are really what they seem to be? I do not quite understand you, Monsieur Poirot. Well, to give you an example, we find a woman's handkerchief. Did a woman drop it, or did a man committing the crime say to himself, "I will make this look like a woman's crime"? I will stab my enemy an unnecessary number of times, making some of the blows feeble and ineffective, and I will drop this handkerchief when no one can miss it. That is one possibility. Then there is another. Did a woman kill him, and did she deliberately drop a pipe cleaner to make it look like a man's work, or are we seriously to suppose that two people, a man and a woman, were separately concerned, and that each was so careless as to drop a clue to their identity? Now it is a little too much of a coincidence, that. But where does the hat box come in? Asked the doctor, still puzzled. Ah, I am coming to that. As I say. These clues: the watch stopped at a quarter past one, the handkerchief, the pipe cleaner. They may be genuine or they may be fake. As to that, I cannot yet tell. But there is one clue here which I believe, though again I may be wrong, has not been faked. I mean, this flat match, Monsieur le Docteur. I believe that that match was used by the murderer, not by Monsieur Ratchet. It was used to burn an incriminating paper of some kind, possibly a note. If so, there was something in that note, some mistake, some error, that left a possible clue to the assailant. I am going to endeavour to resurrect what that something was. He went out of the compartment and returned a few moments later with a small spirit stove and a pair of curling tongs. I use them for the moustaches,、uh, he said, referring to the latter. The doctor watched him with great interest. He flattened out the two humps of wire, and with great care wriggled the charred scrap of paper onto one of them. He clapped the other on top of it, and then, holding both pieces together with the tongs, held the whole thing over the flame of the spirit lamp. <laughs> it is a very makeshift affair, this," he said over his shoulder. "Let us hope that it will answer its purpose." The doctor watched the proceedings attentively. The metal began to glow. Suddenly, he saw faint indication of letters. Words formed themselves slowly. Words of fire. It was a very tiny scrap. Only three words, and a part of another showed. Member, little, Daisy, Armstrong. Poirot gave a sharp exclamation. "What it tells you something?" asked the doctor. Poirot's eyes were shining. He laid down the tongs carefully. "Yes," he said. "I know the dead man's real name. I know why he had to leave America." "Well, what was his name?" "Cassetti." "Cassetti." Constantine knitted his eyebrows. It brings back to me something. Some years ago, I cannot remember. It—it it was a case in America, was it not? Yes," said Poirot, 
a case in America. Further than that, Poirot was not disposed to be communicative. He looked round him as he went on. Well, we will go into all that presently. Let us first make sure that we have seen all there is to be seen here. Quickly and deftly, he went once more through the pockets of the dead man's clothes, but found nothing there of interest. He tried the communicating door, which led through to the next compartment, but it was bolted on the other side. There is one thing I do not understand," said Doctor Constantine. If the murderer did not escape through the window, and if this communicating door was bolted on the other side, <laughs> and if the door into the corridor was not only locked on the inside but chained. How then did the murderer leave the compartment? How、oh, that is what the audience says when a person bound hand and foot is shut into a cabinet and disappears. You mean? I mean, explained Poirot, that if the murderer intended us to believe that he had escaped by way of the window, he would naturally make it appear that the other two exits were impossible, <laughs> like the disappearing person in the cabinet. It is a trick. It is our business to find out how the trick is done. He locked the communicating door on their side. In case, he said, the excellent Mrs. Abbott should take it into her head to acquire first-hand details of the crime to write to her daughter.、Hmm? He looked round once more. Well, there is nothing more to do here, I think. Let us rejoin Monsieur Pouc. Chapter Eight: The Armstrong Kidnapping Case. They found Monsieur Bouc finishing an omelette. I thought it best to have lunch served immediately in the restaurant car, he said. Afterwards, it will be clear that Monsieur Poirot can conduct his examination of the passengers there. In the meantime, I have ordered them to bring us three some food here. Ah,、oh, an excellent idea," said Poirot. Neither of the other two men was hungry, and the meal was soon eaten. But not till they were sipping their coffee did Monsieur Bouc mention the subject that was occupying all their minds. "Eh bien?" he asked. "Eh bien? I have discovered the identity of the victim. I know why it was imperative he should leave America." "But who was he?" "Hm. Do you remember a reading of the Armstrong baby? This is the man who murdered little Daisy Armstrong." Cassetti, ah,、oh, I recall it now. Oh, mo 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 mo, a shocking affair, though I cannot remember the details. Colonel Armstrong was an Englishman, a V.C. He was half American, as his mother was a daughter of W.K. Van der Helt, the Wall Street millionaire. He married the daughter of Linda Arden, the most famous tragic American actress of her day. They lived in America and had one child, a girl, whom they idolized. When she was three years old, she was kidnapped, and an impossibly high sum demanded as the price of her return. I will not weary you with all the intricacies that followed, but I will come to the moment when, after having paid over the enormous sum of two hundred thousand dollars, the child's dead body was discovered. It having been dead at least a fortnight, public indignation rose to fever point, and there was worse to follow. Mrs. Armstrong was expecting another child. Following the shock of the discovery, she gave birth to a dead child born prematurely, and herself died. Her broken-hearted husband shot himself. Ah,、oh, mon Dieu! What a tragedy! I remember now," said Monsieur Bouc. "But there was also another death, if I remember rightly. Yes, an unfortunate French or Swiss nursemaid. The police were convinced that she had some knowledge of the crime. They refused to believe her hysterical denials, and finally, in a fit of despair, the poor girl threw herself from a window and was killed. It was proved afterwards that she was absolutely innocent of any complicity in the crime.、Hmm. It is not good to think of," said Monsieur Bouc. About six months later, this man Cassetti was arrested as the head of the gang who had kidnapped the child. They had used the same methods in the past. If the police seemed likely to get on their trail, they had killed their prisoner, hidden their body, and continued to extract as much money as possible before the crime was discovered. 
Now, I will make clear to you this, my friend. Cassetti was the man, but by means of the enormous wealth he had piled up and by the secret hold he had over various persons, he was acquitted on some technical inaccuracy. And notwithstanding that, he would have been lynched by the populace had he not been clever enough to give them the slip. It is now clear to me what happened. He changed his name and left America. Since then, he has been a gentleman of leisure, traveling abroad and living on his rents. Ah, quel animal! Monsieur Bookstone was redolent of heartfelt disgust. I cannot regret that he is dead, not at all. Hmm? I agree with you. To the men, it is not necessary that he should be killed on the Orient Express. There are other places. Poirot smiled a little. He realized that Monsieur Bouc was biased in the matter. Now the question we have now to ask ourselves is this, he said. Is this murder of the work of some rival gang whom Cassetti had double-crossed in the past, or is it an act of private vengeance? He explained his discovery of the few words on the charred fragment of paper. If I am right in my assumption that the letter was burned by the murderer, why? Because it mentioned the word Armstrong, which is the clue to the mystery. Are there any members of the Armstrong family living? That, unfortunately, I do not know. I think I remember reading of a younger sister of Mrs. Armstrong's. Poirot went on to relate the joint conclusions of himself and Dr. Constantine. Monsieur Bouc brightened at the mention of the broken watch. Mm-hmm. That seems to give us the time of the crime very exactly. Yes, said Poirot. It is very convenient. There was an indescribable something in his tone that made both the other two look at him curiously. You say that you yourself heard Ratchet speak to the conductor at twenty minutes to one? Poirot related just what had occurred. Well, said Monsieur Bouc, that proves at least that Cassetti, or Ratchet, as I shall continue to call him, was certainly alive at twenty minutes to one. Twenty-three minutes to one, to be precise. Oh, well, then at twelve-thirty-seven, to put it formally, Monsieur Ratchet was alive. Well, that is one fact, at least. Poirot did not reply. He sat looking thoughtfully in front of him. There was a tap on the door, and the restaurant attendant entered. The restaurant car is free now, monsieur, he said. Well, we will go there, said Monsieur Bouc, rising. I may accompany you, asked Constantine. Oh, certainly, my dear doctor, unless Monsieur Poirot has any objection. Oh, not at all, not at all, said Poirot. After a little politeness in the matter of procedure, uh, après vous, monsieur, oh, mais non, après vous, they left the compartment. Part two. The Evidence. Chapter 1. The Evidence of the Wagon Lee Conductor In the restaurant car, all was readiness. Poirot and Monsieur Bouc sat together on one side of a table. The doctor sat across the aisle. On the table in front of Poirot was a plan of the Istanbul Calais coach, with the names of the passengers marked in red ink. The passports and tickets were in a pile at one side. There was writing paper, ink, pen and pencils. Excellent! said Poirot. We can open our court of inquiry without more ado. First, I think, we should take the evidence of the wagon lee conductor. You probably know something about the man. What character has he? Now, is he a man in whose word you would place reliance? Ooh. I should say so most assuredly. Pierre Michel has been employed by the company for over fifteen years. He is a Frenchman. Lives near Calais. Thoroughly respectable and honest, not perhaps remarkable for his brains. Poirot nodded comprehendingly. Good, he said. Let us see him. <laughs> Pierre Michel had recovered some of his assurance, but he was still extremely nervous. I hope uh, Monsieur will not think there has been any negligence on my part. Huh? 
he said anxiously, his eyes going from Poirot to Monsieur Bouc. It is a terrible thing that has happened. I hope Monsieur does not think that it reflects on me in any way. Having soothed the man's fears, Poirot began his questions. He first elicited Michel's name and address, his length of service, and the length of time he had been on this particular route. These particulars he already knew, but the routine questions served to put the man at his ease. And now, went on Poirot, let us come to the events of last night. Monsieur Ratchet retired to bed when? Uh, almost immediately after dinner, monsieur. Uh, actually, before we left Belgrade. So he did on the previous night. He had directed me to make up the bed while he was at dinner, and I did so. Mm. Did anybody go into his compartment afterwards? His valet, monsieur, and the young American gentleman, his secretary. Anyone else? No, monsieur, but not that I know of. Good. And that is the last you saw or heard of him? Uh, no, monsieur, you forget, he rang his bell uh, uh, about twenty to one, soon after we had stopped. Oh, uh, what happened exactly? I knocked at the door, but he called out and said he had made a mistake. In English or in French? In French. Ah, and what were his words exactly? Uh, ce n'est rien, je me suis trompé. Ah, quite right, said Poirot. That is what I heard. And then you went away? Yes, monsieur. Did you go back to your seat? No, monsieur. I went first to answer another bell that had just rung. Now, Michel, I'm going to ask you an important question. Where were you at a quarter past one? I, monsieur, I, I was at my little seat at the end, facing up the corridor. You are sure? Ah, oh, mais oui. At least, uh, yes. I went into the next coach, the Athens coach, to speak to my colleague there. We spoke about the snow. Now, that was sometime soon after one o'clock, but I cannot say exactly. And you returned when? One of my bells rang, monsieur, I remember. I told you, it was the American lady. She had rung several times. I recollect, said Poirot. And after that? After that, monsieur, I answered your bell and brought you some mineral water. Then, about half an hour later, I made up the bed in one of the other compartments. Oh, that of the young American gentleman, monsieur Ratchet's secretary. Was monsieur McQueen alone in his compartment when you went to make up his bed? Uh, the English colonel from number 15 was with him. They had been sitting talking. And what did the colonel do when he left monsieur McQueen? He went back to his own compartment. Now, number fifteen, that is quite close to your seat, is it not? Yes, monsieur. It is the second compartment from that end of the corridor. Now, his bed was already made up. Yes, monsieur, I had made it up while he was at dinner. What time was all this? I could not say exactly, monsieur, but... Uh, not later than two o'clock, certainly. And after that? After that, monsieur, I sat in my seat till morning. You did not go again into the Athens coach? No, monsieur. Perhaps you slept? I do not think so, monsieur. The train being at a standstill prevented me from dozing off as I usually do. Uh, did you see any of the passengers moving up or down the corridor? The man reflected. One of the ladies went to the toilette at the far end, I think. Ah, which lady? I do not know, monsieur. It was far down the corridor, and she had her back to me. She... She had on a kimono of scarlet with dragons on it. Poirot nodded. And after that? Nothing, monsieur, until the morning. You are sure? Ah, pardon. You yourself, monsieur, opened your door and looked out for a second. Good, my friend, said Poirot. I wondered whether you would remember that. Oh, now, uh, by the way, I was awakened by what sounded like something heavy falling against my door. Have you any idea what that could have been? The man stared at him. Ah, oh, that was nothing, monsieur, nothing. I am positive of it. Ah, well, then I must have had the cauchemar, said Poirot philosophically. Unless, said Monsieur Bouc, it was something in the compartment next door that you heard. Poirot took no notice of the suggestion. Uh, perhaps he did not wish to before the wagon lee conductor. Uh, let us pass to another point, he said. Supposing that last night an assassin 
joined the train. Is it quite certain that he could not have left it after committing the crime? Pierre Michel shook his head. Nor that he can be concealed on it somewhere? No, 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 it has been well searched, said Monsieur Bouc. Abandon that idea, my friend. Uh, besides, said Michel, no one could get on to the sleeping car without my seeing them. When was the last stop? Vinkovki. And what time was that? Uh, we should have left there at uh, 11.58, but owing to the weather we were twenty minutes late. Uh, and someone might have come along from the ordinary part of the train? Oh, no, monsieur. After the service of dinner, the door between the ordinary carriages and the sleeping cars <laughs> is locked. Hmm. Did you yourself descend from the train at Vinkovki? Yes, monsieur. I got down onto the platform as usual and stood by the step up into the train. The other conductors did the same. What about the forward door, the one near the restaurant car? Ah, it is always fastened on the inside. But it is not fastened now. The man looked surprised. Then his face cleared. But at least one of the passengers has opened it to look out on the snow. Probably, said Poirot. He tapped thoughtfully on the table for a minute or two. Monsieur does not blame me, said the man timidly. Poirot smiled on him kindly. Well, you had the evil chance, my friend, he said. Ah, one other point while I remember it. You said that another bell rang just as you were knocking at Monsieur Ratchet's door. In fact, I heard it myself. Whose was it? It was the bell of Madame la Princesse Dragomiroff. She desired me to summon her maid. And you did so? Yes, monsieur. Poirot studied the plan in front of him thoughtfully. Then he inclined his head. That is all, he said, for the moment. Thank you, monsieur. The man rose. He looked at Monsieur Bouc. Do not distress yourself, said the latter kindly. I cannot see there has been any negligence on your part. Gratified, Pierre Michel left the compartment. Chapter 2 The Evidence of the Secretary for a minute or two, Poirot remained lost in thought. I think, he said at last, that it would be well to have a further word with Monsieur McQueen, in view of what we now know. The young American appeared promptly. Well, he said, how are things going? Oh, well, not too badly. Since our last conversation, I have learned something. <laughs> the identity of Monsieur Ratchet. Hector McQueen leaned forward interestedly. Yes, he said. Ratchet, as you suspected, was merely an alias. Hmm? Ratchet was Cassetti, the man who ran the celebrated kidnapping stunts, including the famous affair of little Daisy Armstrong. An expression of utter astonishment appeared on McQueen's face. Then it darkened. The damned skunk, he exclaimed. You had no idea of this, Monsieur McQueen? No, sir, said the young American decidedly. If I had, I'd have cut off my right hand before it had a chance to do secretarial work for him. You feel strongly about the matter, Monsieur McQueen? Oh, I have a particular reason for doing so. My father was the district attorney who handled the case, Monsieur Poirot. I saw Mrs. Armstrong more than once. Oh, she was a lovely woman. So gentle and heartbroken, his face darkened. If ever a man deserved what he got, Ratchet, or <laughs> Cassetti, is the man. I'm rejoiced at his end. Such a man wasn't fit to live. So you almost feel as though you would have been willing to do the good deed yourself? I do. I... He paused, then flushed rather guiltily. Seems I'm kind of incriminating myself... <laughs> Well, I should be more inclined to suspect you, Monsieur McQueen, if you displayed an inordinate sorrow at your employer's decease. Oh, I don't think I could do that, even to save myself the chair, said McQueen grimly. Then he added, 
If I'm not being unduly curious, just how did you figure this out? Cassetti's identity, I mean. All by a fragment of a letter found in his compartment. But surely, I, I mean, that, that was rather careless of the old man. Well, that depends, said Poirot, on the point of view. The young man seemed to find this remark rather baffling. He stared at Poirot as though trying to make him out. The task before me, said Poirot, is to make sure of the movements of everyone on the train. No offence need be taken. You understand it is only a matter of routine. Sure. I, well, get right on with it and let me clear my character if I can. Now, I need hardly ask you the number of your compartment, said Poirot, smiling. Since I shared it with you for a night, it is a second-class compartment, numbers six and seven, and after my departure, you add it to yourself. Yeah, that's right. Now, Monsieur McQueen, I want you to describe your movements last night from the time of leaving the dining car. Well, that's quite easy. I went back to my compartment, read a bit, got out on the platform at Belgrade, decided it was too cold, and got in again. I talked for a while to a young English lady who was in the compartment next to mine. Then I fell into conversation with that Englishman, Colonel Abathnot. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I think you passed us as we were talking. Then, uh, well, I went into Mr. Ratchet and, as I told you, took down some memoranda of letters he wanted written. I said goodnight to him and left him. The Colonel Abathnot was still standing in the corridor. Well, his compartment was already made up for the night, so I suggested that he should come along to mine. I ordered a couple of drinks, and we got right down to it, you know, discussed world politics and the government of India and our own troubles with the financial situation and the Wall Street crisis. I, I don't, as a rule, cotton on to Britishers. They're a stiff-necked lot, but, uh, no, well, I, I liked this one. Do you know what time it was when he left you? Ah, uh, well, pretty late. Getting on for two o'clock, I should say. And you noticed that the train had stopped? Oh, yes. We, we wondered a bit. Looked out and saw the snow lying very thick, but, uh, well, we, we didn't think it was serious. What happened when Colonel Labathnot finally said good night? Why, well, he, he went along to his compartment, and I called to the conductor to make up my bed. And where were you whilst he was making it? Standing just outside the door in the corridor, smoking a cigarette. And then? Oh, and then I went to bed and slept till morning. Now, during the evening, did you leave the train at all? Our Barthnot and I thought we'd get out at, well, now, what was the name of the place? Uh, oh, yeah, a Vinkovki, to stretch our legs a bit. And, well, it was bitterly cold, a blizzard on. We soon hopped back again. <laughs> by which door did you leave the train? Uh, by the one nearest to our compartment. Uh, the one next to the dining car? Yes. Do you remember if it was bolted? McQueen considered why, yes, I seem to remember it was. At least there was a kind of bar that fitted across the handle. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes. On getting back into the train, did you replace that bar? Oh, why, no, I, I don't think I did. I got in last. No, no, I, I, I don't seem to remember doing so. He said suddenly, I, Is that an important point? Right, maybe. Now, I presume, monsieur, that while you and Colonel Abathnot were sitting talking, the door of your compartment into the corridor was open? Hector McQueen nodded. I want you, if you can, to tell me if anyone passed along the corridor after the train left Vinkovki until the time you parted company for the night. McQueen drew his brows together. Oh, I think the conductor passed along once, he said coming from the direction of the dining car, and oh, a woman passed the other way going towards it. Which woman? Well, I couldn't say. I, I, didn't, I didn't really notice. You see, I was just arguing a point with our bath nod. I, I just seemed to remember a glimpse of some scarlet silk affair passing the door. Well, I didn't look, and anyway, I, I wouldn't have seen the person's face. As you know, my carriage faces the dining car end of the train, so a woman going along the corridor in... That direction would have had her back to me as soon as she'd passed. Poirot nodded. She was going to the toilet, I presume? Well, I suppose so. And you saw her return? Well, no. Now that you mention it, I, I, I didn't notice her returning, but I suppose she must have done so. One more question. 
Do you smoke a pipe, Monsieur McQueen? No, sir, I do not. Poirot paused a moment. Well, I think that is all at present. I should now like to see the valet of Monsieur Ratchet. Oh, uh, by the way, did both you and he always travel second class? He did, but I usually went first, if possible, in the adjoining compartment to Mr. Ratchet. Then he had most of his baggage put in my compartment, and yet could get at both it and me easily when he chose. But on this occasion, all the first-class berths were booked except the one which he took. I comprehend. Thank you, Monsieur McQueen. Chapter Three, Evidence of the Valet. The American was succeeded by the pale Englishman, with the inexpressive face, whom Poirot had already noticed on the day before. He stood waiting very correctly. Poirot motioned him to sit down. You are, I understand, the valet of Monsieur Ratchet. Yes, sir. Your name? Edward Henry Masterman. Your age? Thirty-nine. And your home address? At twenty-one Friar Street, Clerkenwell. And you have heard that your master has been murdered. Uh, yes, sir. A very shocking occurrence. Will you now tell me, please, at what hour you last saw Monsieur Ratchet? The valet considered. Uh, it must have been about nine o'clock, sir, last night. That or a little after. Tell me in your own words exactly what happened. Well, I went into Mr. Ratchet as usual, sir, and attended to his wants. And what were your duties exactly? To fold or hang up his clothes, sir. Put his dental plate in water, and see that he had everything he wanted for the night. Was his manner much the same as usual? The valet considered a moment. Well, sir, I, I think he was upset. Oh, in what way upset? Over a letter he'd been reading. He asked me if it was I who had put it in his compartment. Of course, I told him I hadn't done any such thing, but he swore at me and. Found fault with everything I did. Oh, was that usual? Oh no, sir. He, he lost his temper easily. As I say, it just depended what had happened to upset him. Did your master ever take a sleeping draught? Doctor Constantine leaned forward a little. Always when travelling by train, sir. He said he couldn't sleep otherwise. And do you know what drug he was in the habit of taking? Well, no, I couldn't say. I'm sure, sir. There was no name on the bottle, just the sleeping draught to be taken at bedtime. And did he take it last night? Yes, sir. I poured it into a glass and put it on top of the toilet table, ready for him. You didn't actually see him drink it? And no, sir. And what happened next? Well, I asked if there was anything further and asked what time Mr. Ratchet would like to be called in the morning. He said he didn't want to be disturbed till he rang. Oh, was that usual? Oh, quite usual, sir. Yes.、Uh, well, he, he used to ring the bell for the conductor and then send him for me when he was ready to get up. Was he usually an early or a late riser? Ah,、uh, well, depended, sir, on his mood. Sometimes he'd get up for breakfast. Sometimes he wouldn't get up till just on lunchtime. So that you weren't alarmed when the morning wore on and no summons came. No, sir. Did you know that your master had enemies? Yes, sir. The man spoke quite unemotionally. How did you know? I had heard him discussing some letters, sir, with Mister McQueen. Had you an affection for your employer, Masterman? Masterman's face became, if possible, even more inexpressive than it was normally. I should hardly like to say that, sir. He was a generous employer, but you didn't like him. Shall we put it that I don't care very much for Americans, sir? Have you ever been in America? No, sir. Do you remember reading in the paper of the Armstrong kidnapping case? A little colour came into the man's cheeks. Ah, yes, indeed, sir. 
A little baby girl, wasn't it? A very shocking affair. Did you know that your employer, Monsieur Ratchet, was the principal instigator in that affair? No, indeed, sir. The valet's tone held positive warmth and feeling for the first time. I can hardly believe it, sir. Nevertheless, it is true. Now, to pass to your own movements last night, a matter of routine, you understand? <laughs> what did you do after leaving your master? I told Mr. McQueen, sir, that the master wanted him, and then I went to my own compartment and read. Now, your compartment was uh, the end second class one, sir, next to the dining car. Poirot was looking at his plan. I see. And you had which berth? Uh, the lower one, sir. And that is number four? Yes, sir. Is there anyone in with you? Uh, yes, sir, a big Italian fellow. Oh, uh, does he speak English? Uh, well, a kind of English, sir. The valet's tone was deprecating. He's been in America. Chicago, I understand. Do you and he talk together much? No, sir. I prefer to read. Poirot smiled. He could visualise the scene, the large, voluble Italian and the snub direct administered by the gentleman's gentleman. And what, may I ask, are you reading? He inquired. At present, sir, I'm reading Love's Captive by Mrs. Arabella Richardson. Oh, a good story? I find it highly enjoyable, sir. Uh, yeah, well, <coughs> let us continue. Uh, you returned to your compartment and read Love's Captive till when? At about 10.30, sir. This Italian wanted to go to bed, so the conductor came and made the beds up. And then you went to bed and to sleep? Well, I went to bed, sir, but I didn't sleep. Oh, why didn't you sleep? I had the toothache, sir. Oh, la la, that is painful. Most painful, sir. Did you do anything for it? Well, I applied a little oil of clothes, sir, which relieved the pain a little. But I was still not able to get to sleep. I turned the light on above my bed and continued to read, to take my mind off it, as it were. And did you not go to sleep at all? Oh, yes, sir, I dropped off about four in the morning. And your companion? Well, the Italian fellow? Oh, he just snored. Oh, he did not leave the compartment at all during the night? No, sir. Did you? No, sir. Did you hear anything during the night? I don't think so, sir. Nothing unusual, I mean. The train being at a standstill made it all very quiet. Poirot was silent a moment or two. Then he said, Well, I think there is very little more to be said. You cannot throw any light upon the tragedy? I'm afraid not. I'm sorry, sir. So as far as you know, was there any quarrel or bad blood between your master and Monsieur McQueen? Oh, no, sir. Mr. McQueen was a very pleasant gentleman. Where were you in service before you came to Monsieur Ratchet? With Sir Henry Tomlinson, sir, in Grosvenor Square. Oh, and why did you leave him? He was going to East Africa, sir, and, well, did not require my services any longer. But I'm sure he will speak for me, sir. I was with him some years. And you have been with Monsieur Ratchet? How long? Uh, just over nine months, sir. Mm. Well, thank you, Master Man. Oh, by the way, are you a pipe smoker? No, sir. I only smoke cigarettes. Gaspers, sir. Oh, thank you. That will do. Poirot gave him a nod of dismissal. The valet hesitated a moment. Uh, uh, you'll excuse me, sir, but uh, the elderly American lady is in what I might describe as a state, sir. She's saying she knows all about the murderer, and she's in a very excitable condition, sir. In that case, said Poirot, smiling, we had better see her next. Well, shall I tell her, sir? She's been demanding to see someone in authority for a long time. The conductor's been trying to pacify her. Send her to us, my friend, said Poirot. We will listen to her story now. End of side two.